Hello, everyone. Welcome into Kwani Has Questions. It's a fairly new series that we're doing here on NBC10 Boston. If you are familiar with 10 Questions on NBC10 Boston, same format, having great conversation with great people, and just going from there. So joining me today is Topper Karu, who's actually from Roxbury, grew up in Roxbury, DC raised him. We're going to get into that in just a little bit. You may have heard of this little show called Martin, which he was the co-founder of. But also today, one thing we're going to talk about as well is his new film, which is actually traveling quite literally around the world above us right now at the International Space Station. Topper, welcome. We have so much to talk to. It's so nice meeting you. Well, 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 thank you for having me. And uh, it feels good. It feels good already. Mm -hmm. So let's just start with your film, This Little Light of Mine. It's mm -hmm. currently at the International Space Center uh, Station. I was trying to track it right before this. And last I saw, it was hovering right above the top of Africa. I think it may be hitting towards Russia right now. But mm -hmm. what went behind the perspective for you of wanting this film to literally be on top of us? the light of mine all, all over the world <laughs> uh, uh to be to be very honest and to and let you know it goes around the earth 12 times a day mm -hmm. um i wanted to do uh, something to address all of the darkness that's in the universe right now you know the wars the division you know the racial animosity you know, uh, you know, the, you know, anti-Semitism, uh, the sexism. And, you know, I just wanted to do something really cool and really positive. And when I was a uh, voter registration worker in the South uh, as a young student and uh, was a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in Mississippi, I might add, Mm -hmm. uh, there was a woman uh, who had joined with us in that voter registration work, and her name was Fannie Lou Hamer. Uh, she had been a timekeeper on a uh, plantation in Ruleville, Mississippi, and she wanted to vote. And she went down to register to vote, attempted, and her plantation owner became very distressed at that you know, given that she wanted to express herself as being a part of the democratic system, uh, he fired her. And uh, and then she joined with us. And then from that point on, she was heavily persecuted. She was beaten. She was jailed. And she ultimately became the chairwoman of something called the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which challenged the traditional ongoing segregationist party in Mississippi. And uh, she challenged them at the Democratic Convention. So in our rallies, when we would, you know, begin a new campaign and we would meet in churches quite usually and quite often, she would lead us in song. And one of the songs that she would lead us in that, you know, would give us courage you know, that would eradicate fear and that would give us spirit with her an, a wonderful and powerful and sincere voice. She would lead us in a song called This Little Light of Mine. Now, what's so curious about that song is people all around the world know that song. And that song, as sung by Miss Haber, you know, uh, has lived in my heart and mind and spirit ever since my time in Mississippi. So I was asked to, to uh, come to China to design a Mars colony because, you know, I'm an architect and a technologist and I know a lot about, you know, uh, food growth systems, robotic housing, you know, folding vehicles. I mean, all the kind of stuff that you would need in a Mars colony. And, you know, I was treated royally in, in, in China, you know, uh, I was the only black person that I saw. And that was when I looked in the mirror in the morning. And, uh, but I was treated royally banquets, you know, when, when my associate Milton Kotler and I got to, uh, to China, 
we were the first ones off the plane. We didn't have to go through customs. They wished us into limousine after limousine, took us into uh, Shenzhen from Hong Kong. And I shook a lot of hands. I did a fair number of speeches. Um, I was treated royally. Uh, there was never any question about my color or my race. It was just about uh, this man has the knowledge. We want to know what you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I wasn't feeling China and I wasn't feeling the trip. It's a very, very long ride. That's true. And, you know, I, I thought that rather than give them all of that technological information that I had in my portfolio, you know, I'd rather transfer that knowledge to HBCUs, to communities that are, you know, trying to elevate. And so uh, I said, look, having met a whole bunch of the space players, you know, due to the research I had done, I want to do something else. And so they said, well, what's that? I said, I want to make a film about children from around the world singing This Little Light of Mine. And uh, they said, well, write it up. I wrote up my piece, you know, about a page. And I sent it to them. And then they sent it to somebody in Dubai who was the green button man. This was a per person who could push the button. Hmm. So it got to his desk. He picks it up and he goes, Topper. He goes, oh, hell yeah. We'll get it done. <laughs> and he had been a brother that I had helped when he was trying to establish a writing career in Los Angeles. And he never forgot. Wow. And, uh, he was, you know, he was in right place, right time. So uh, he approved the project. And then the next thing was, how are we going, how are we going to fund this thing? So I, I wrestled and wrestled and struggled with myself. And finally, my, my family's philanthropy wrote the check. And that makes me a son of Roxbury. Uh, maybe... Uh, to be the first uh, black man in history to send up something to the International Space Station on an independent basis, and now it's going around the world, and now I'm in the in the in the space thing, you know, where space is the place. <laughs> guys in the White House, you know, and there are more space projects on deck. Uh, but I thought it would be interesting to do this one independently to. Mm -hmm more black philanthropy, okay? I thought it would be important uh, for uh, me to do this so uh, young children could possibly become smarter about space, maybe inspired to get into the space game, given that it is going to be a very powerful emerging dealio. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it ends up just being a good thing. But at the same time, the children's voices seem to have a resonant quality because people have told me they were having a bad day and they looked at this, this film and they felt better. You know, so it's a, it's a feel-good love pill. And immersed in it are messages of love, peace, joy, you know, cooperation, uh, you know, one love, love versus hate, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to, to put that energy out in the universe. And, you know, my feeling about it is if it just captures one, two, 200, 2,000, 200,000 people, I'm happy if it just captures that one or two, you know, and it'll be around for a while. Yeah, it makes a difference. And and to your point, the video is eight and a half minutes. If people want to go and check it out, I would highly recommend doing so. And you just said so much that I could go in so many different directions with this interview at this point. But I want to just go back quickly because we mentioned the Mars colonies, which you were initially working on when you were sent to China. And I was obviously reading up more about your background. You went to the University of Howard University, HU which we're gonna talk about HBCUs as well for architecture. But then you also went to Yale for environmental design and then you 
I know you saw you got a fellowship at MIT as well. So a lot education has clearly been the backbone of a lot of the work that you've done, whether it's been in the film space or in the more STEM science space. Someone's trying to get in on our conversation. (laughs) That's my accountant. Uh, (laughs) Speaking of STEM and (laughs) mathematics, but... I, I ask about the education portion because, again, you mentioned growing up in Roxbury. So what really, if you could kind of sum it up, was that journey from growing up here in Boston, ending up at HU, coming back um, to the New England area to attend Yale? But how has education been the forefront of most of your career? Well, it's been the forefront of my life, really, because, um, you know, my cousins and I uh, integrated a school before busing, and that was tough. You know, I had a black eye in the fourth grade. I had a black eye in the fifth grade. You know, a, a white friend was hanging out with me, and a group of white boys rushed us, and they beat him for being with me. They didn't touch me, but they beat him for being with me. And was it so. Like that? Was no, program. no. This no. was this was Topper Carew's grandmother teaching him how to ride the bus mm. to a school outside of Roxbury. Mm-hmm. The thought being that myself and my cousins would get a better education there. So not only did I get an education, but I got a couple of whoopings. And it, it street education. <laughs> I got some street education, and that's probably why. I eventually would run on the track team because every boy in my family had to make a run for it. And so that experience lived on in a a traumatic kind of way, even though I buried it deep in my spirit. Hmm. And so um, when I got to high school, High school for me was Boston Technical, which has since become John O'Brien, the John O'Brien School. Mathematics school. The mathematics school. So I was on a college track. At that time, it was all boys. And uh, I got to my senior year after having worked at uh, Harvard in the Society House. You know, when I was, I don't know, 15, 16, I was a junior and a senior. And, you know, my job was to make sure they had glasses at the bar, that the tables were cleared, you know. Uh, but I was a gopher. You know, I had a little white jacket, you know, some black pants and a bow tie. And all these students used to come to me and ask me for dating advice. Now, I'm 15. I know I had a little ghost of a mustache. And so I'm saying, they're asking me for dating advice? I can't. Right. I can hardly get my dating life together, but I'm going to play it. Mm-hmm. So I'd give them the advice. And then by the end of the night, they would get uh, drunk and throw roast beef up on the wall and and all that kind of stuff. So I had never really been exposed to the inside of a college. So my attitude was, oh, if this is college, I can do this. Sign me up. I had, hey, sign me up. I'm ready. And this is Harvard? Okay, so <laughs> now I come into the uh, guidance counselor's office you know, a Mr. O'Brien, an older uh, Irish gentleman who'd been in the school, you know, probably a hundred years. And he says, uh, Carew, you know, you're a senior. What you, go, what you gonna do, man? I said, well, uh, I wanna go to college. And uh, he, he says to me, college? He says, I think you'd be better off going to the Navy Yard as a sheet metal worker. Now, I wasn't feeling sheet metal. And, you know, I had an education from my grandfather at home. He used to make me read the encyclopedia. I couldn't buy toys. We would make all my toys. You know, we'd be reading popular electronics, popular mechanics. And, you know, and he's, he's trying to teach me, you know, develop a research thing, you know, look deeper on the knowledge side. And frankly, High school was very boring. And so he had also made me memorize a poem called If. And in that line, 
there's a line that says, if you can believe in yourself when all men doubt you. So I'm looking at this guidance counselor. This line is running through my line, through my head, and I'm going, this dude is ridiculous. So as God would have it, you know, three weeks later, they hired a man named John O'Brien, who was African American, and who the school is now named for. And, you know, he had been a uh, youth worker in my neighborhood. Him, Mel King, Jeep Jones, uh, Reverend Mike Haynes. Those four men, by the way, were responsible for more people from and kids from our neighborhood on a per capita basis going to college than any other section of Boston. Mm -hmm. And they, they were the ones. And, and, and a lot of us went to the HBCUs. So... O'Brien says to me, well, listen, Karuba, you're a your curiosity to me, man. He said, you know, you're testing right at the top here in the school, man. This, and this is a technical school. Oh, math, a, yeah, technical math school. And it's a test school, right? It's all boys then, mm -hmm. test school. He said, but you got no grades, man. I said, well, I don't, I'm not feeling it, you know, and, and I'm, not, I'm not liking it, man. And I've only got uh, two subjects that I really like. One of them is track, and the other one is lunch. And so I'm going, you know, I'm just not feeling it. So he said, well, look, I'll tell you what. He said, if you work this year and you get your grades, uh, you know, I'll get you into the Black Harvard. Because I'd said to him I want to go to Harvard. Hmm. He said, I'll get you into the Black Harvard. And so he got me into Howard University, which changed my life. Because when I was in the Boston public system, uh, K through uh, 12, I only, I only saw one black teacher. And most of those teachers didn't have a particular love, you know, for boys of color. And uh, when I got to Howard and those professors would walk up in those rooms, you know, with a stack of books under their arms. But when you know that they had a certain love for you, and that there was a certain dedication, there was affirmation, there was cultural competency, there was expectation. I got I got a little bit busy. Well, of course, I was cocky coming from Boston because they thought everybody coming from Boston was an aristocrat and was rich. I was an aristocrat and I wasn't rich. And you know, I played that I played that card for a little while, mm -hmm. and then I went to a game at uh, Virginia State and uh, we were coming back from the game and a car crashed into the back of us and it didn't stop, took off. We chased it. Then the police are chasing us. And then we pull up into an army base. Police come to our car, ask what happened. We said, we're chasing the car ahead of us because they mm -hmm. crashed. They crashed into us, went to the other car and it was, you know, uh, you know, full of white occupants, they let them go and they came back and they arrested our driver. I'm wow. pissed off. That was my first time in the South. Mm -hmm. I'd experienced racism in the North, so I was kind of acclimated to it, but I'd never seen anything that blatant. So I came back to Howard and I joined the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Now, going to Howard, you know, made me think and made me be embraced and affirmed you know, and uh, uh, having that car running towards in Virginia, you know, sort of triggered my, you know, my anti-racism vibe, you know, which, which had come to me very, very early when I integrated the school in the fourth grade. So I was ready to roll. I joined the movement and that, that changed my life. So architecture, after being in the South, when I came back, you know, it made me realize I could employ that as a tool that, you know, would support civil rights. You know, one of the things we did from in my architectural firm in D.C. was we designed Resurrection City for the Poor People's Campaign. But all of our work was like that. All of my work has had a thread of equity, justice and excellence. Mm -hmm. And so. That's that's the short answer. That, I know. <laughs> that's the short answer about Howard University. 
you know, Howard is a trip. You know, when you go to a Howard Harvard football game. I went this past year. (laughs) There's a stadium on the Howard side filled. Okay. No, but we're in Boston. Oh, well, I got I got to tell you, the first game it was filled. We draw, we draw, we draw off the Howard side. Okay. <laughs> there were so many people. There were so many people from Howard, but it's it was a beautiful thing. Beautiful. I love Howard. Everyone I know that has been to Howard has had nothing but high words for it. Mm-hmm. I want to touch upon something that you mentioned because this will kind of tie us into the next part of our conversation. You mentioned that everything that you've done in relation to obviously your education, but then your work after has been tied into equity and, and inclusion and excellence. And the most fascinating part about your story to me is still the fact that you have had and continue to have this full architecture engineering career, a very highly successful career at that. And then you just kept happened to have a career in television, which in some ways you architected a story, you know, created a storyline, built a story that has still resonated over the last few generations, the show Martin that a lot of us know about. So how did the TV aspect of your career come into play? Where did that begin? So when I was um, in D.C. and I was uh, doing my architecture, um, I opened a storefront at the street level and kids used to peek in. Um, And I was a curiosity because I had very long hair, a big beard, more coveralls and that was all part of my you know dress because you know i've been this radical and um so one day we decided that what we would do would be uh change up how we practiced and you know we were there because if you had an architectural problem like a uh, you know eminent domain problem which was one of our first big projects. Um, 49 dwelling homes owned by elderly black people were going to be taken by the government. And that was in lieu of of, of sparing a used car lot. So we took on that campaign and we won that campaign. And um, so that was the kind of stuff that I would do. That was the basis of my practice. And We eventually got another storefront. It was an old laundromat. And we opened a program there. And a friend of mine who was teaching the kids art introduced me to a a filmmaker photographer. He said, you know, one of the things that you might consider bringing into the program is photography and maybe even filmmaking. So I got into filmmaking by administering the program that was teaching the kids. And then my architectural partner said, listen, we got a contract to uh, design the uh, Shaw urban renewal area. You know, we were gonna do, we were the conceptual designers, the urban designers and architects for that. And he said, what we should do is we should make a film about the typical family who lives there. So I said, yeah, I said, okay, we'll do that. And that'll be part of our presentation. And film became part of all of our presentations and all of our campaigns. And that's how I learned to make filmmaking. So people would say to me, you're a pretty good filmmaker. And I'd say, no, I'm an architect. No, you're a pretty good filmmaker. So as a goof, I would, I would submit films to festivals and They started winning. And so um, my partner went, left D.C. and went back to Boston, which was also his original home. Hmm. You know, he grew up in Chinatown. He's Chinese. Mm -hmm. And um, he was asked to come to MIT to head the urban design department. And so at MIT, They had started a new program that was headed by Mel King. It was called the Community Fellows Program. And the Community Fellows Program would give you an office, a credit card, a secretary, a travel account, um, you know, a a budget. 
And my partners kept saying to me, uh, Top, you should come back to this program. Well, my work wasn't finished in D.C., so I didn't go. But the, the second year when I was asked if I would like to be a part of that program and be a fellow at MIT, I decided to do it because my maternal grandmother, who had been my big mom, you know, was was not doing well. And, you know, I was the first grandchild. And so I could talk to her in a way that nobody else could talk to her. You know, you know, I was, you know, I was uh, the love of her life, you know, and, and, you know, and so um, I decided I would go home because I wanted to spend time with her. And so I took the fellowship and uh, they had a film, they had a film school. And so I went to the film school because I've been making films, but I essentially went to the film school to see how much I knew. Yeah. And uh, I was going to go to New York and be a, a, a struggling filmmaker. And then Mel convinced me to go to WGBH to produce a program that was failing called Say Brother, which is now Basic Black. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I took the interview. And uh, some people schooled me about television before I went to take the interview. And, you know, I, uh, I managed to get through that interview and I'd already made a bunch of award-winning films. So they said, come to w WGBH. And I uh, was now making film and making television. I rose very quickly there because I think I was there six months and I raised a couple of million dollars. And my grandmother, because I was going to stay for a year. And so my grandmother said, son, you need to go there and spend that money. Look. You need to stay right there. And then I, <laughs> okay. And then I raised a couple more million and then I raised some more money. So uh, I got promoted very quickly to be one of the program managers. You know, with three of us, it was a management team of 11. And, um, you know, Architecture runs through everything that I do because it's a <clears throat> multidisciplinary profession. You got to learn a whole bunch of engineering things. You got to learn design. You got to learn aesthetics. Uh, you got to learn presentation. And so uh, everything that I do in some way or form is touched by design or, you know, elliptical thinking rather than linear thinking. You know, filmmaking is has many different facets to it. And so it's not like just sitting down and writing a book on a piece of paper. You know, you got sound, lights. When I did Martin, I had to deal with 12 unions, you know, all the managers, all the agents, all the families, all the spouses, you know, the children. It's a uh, it's 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 architecture. You know, it's the same same dynamic as architecture. So. I wanted to do a, a narrative programming, you know, I'd capped out at GBH and, you know, I didn't think I'd ever be able to do narrative pro programming there. So I set my goal and, and sights on Hollywood and I got out there and the rest is history. Martin has been on uh, 33 years and now it's moving to Netflix. Took me 12 years to get that. But, but when I went out there, uh, myself and another brother were the only people who really had checkbooks. I'd raised money before I went out there and it was me and Barry Gordy, you know, so I hired every creative writer I could find. And then ultimately after they spent time with me, they all went on to run their own shows. Um, and you know, many of us are still friends. Uh, but, uh, I went out there to change Hollywood, you know, it was no mistake that I hired those writers and those directors and those mm -hmm. actors, you know, I went out there to, to change it. So you, we talk about Roxbury, we talk about Howard and then the show Martin, how do you think your experiences in Boston at a HBCU contributed to the way that show ended up one, not only, not, not only existing, but to your point being something that has become a black cultural icon over the years. I'll, I can tell you very specifically. <clears throat> First of all, it's a romantic comedy. And that's very important. And, uh, you know, I created, I, I found Martin, 
you know, and, and you know, we came together. And I just, I just, my discovery of Martin was in South Central Los Angeles, which was, um, you know, a gunshot zone, you know, and uh, most of my peers, professional, I were afraid to go down there, you know, and, but that's where the raw comedy talent was, the strongest comedy talent was. So I used to go down there, you know, and I, you know, I wasn't afraid of my people because I've been, I've been in Mississippi. Those are my people. <laughs> I've been in Mississippi, right. you know, so um, I used to go down there and, and uh, I saw Robin Harris. He was the MC. Hmm. He was Sweet Dick Willie and uh, Do the Right Thing. He was the father hmm. in the House Party movies. And he was funny. Everybody said he's one of the funniest people I've seen since, since Richard Pryor. Hmm. So that was the first piece of it. <laughs> I uh, got involved in management because I everybody was saying he'll never make it because he has a chipped tooth, he has bloodshot eyes, he's overweight. And I didn't like that conversation. So I got involved in with him as my first management client. And um, we built a house for him. I mean, you know, uh, the tragedy being that he died on the first night of his national tour. But when he left for that tour, he had a three picture deal at Paramount because he had been in uh, Harlem Nights and Eddie loved him. Um, he had a series deal at CBS, and this was the first night of his national tour. So he went home to Chicago. His mother and, and brother had a premonition, so they went with him. Uh, tickets sold out in 20 minutes. Bernie Mac introduced him. Uh, he had two encores. He was incredible. He went back to the hotel, and he died. And... Uh, before he died, he kept saying to me, listen, Martin, you got to take this kid. T Martin, you got to take him. He's So I did. And uh, when we got in a position to make a deal uh, for Martin, uh, the idea, and we made a great deal for him, uh, the, 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 we needed a series idea. OK, and uh, the, the, the best idea that I could imagine was a series about a very, very smart, a.k.a. kind of sister <laughs> and a, a knucklehead brother, you know, who hadn't really been to college, but had ambition. And it was about their relationship. And even though they may have drama or, you know, may have conflict. A messy end, relationship. <laughs> messy. With some messy friends. But at the end of every half hour, they were still in love. And so I felt that that was important because, you know, you kept hearing about the struggle and the dynamic between black men and black women. And I thought that that would be a good thing to do. And so that's part of the reason it's on because we, you know, um, it plays very hard to the strength of black women. And, you know, that's been a very, very important part of our following. And so, and since the brothers in the series can tend to be very funny, it, it doesn't turn off brothers, you know? Yeah. So, um, and then uh, because I'd been to, MIT and been to architectural school, I began to think about the production methodology for the series. So everybody was doing their thing from Monday to, to Friday. I was doing mine first first uh, day of, of uh, when we bring the script to the table was on Wednesday, which meant that I had Saturday and Sunday as additional writing days, having had a rehearsal on Friday so we could rewrite. And then on Monday and Tuesday, Monday, we would have a dress rehearsal in front of an audience. Now, the shows in L.A. typically get their audiences from the tourist traffic that's on Hollywood Boulevard. And those could be people from Iowa. They could be people from Norway, you know. And um, I would get my audiences from Compton, bust them in. And if you ain't funny, they... 
They gonna harm you. Okay, they gonna hurt you. Why was I busted here for a non funny Yeah, they gonna talk about you. They gonna insult you. Okay, so I would do that dress rehearsal on Monday. Then we would tape our two shows on Tuesday. Same thing. Tuesday live audience Compton. Okay, that work's done. You know, audience leaves. Cast goes to dinner. Writers are rewriting. New audience from Compton comes in tape another show, you know, and then we hold the actors in case we need to do any retakes. But the measure of success was determined by the audience that that we want to love the show. Mm -hmm. And so I changed the whole production methodology. And that was based on the fact that, you know, uh, one of the great things about, you know, Howard, you know, and MIT and Yale and all that was, you know, it's, it helps you to flip your thinking, you know, and always, you know, think about how you're thinking about what you're thinking about. And so you, you always get a different result. So by simply changing the production methodology, you know, we were making the comedy more bulletproof. And if we didn't laugh, you know, uh, it wasn't funny. And so the other thing that, that, uh, we used to do before every show we would we would huddle and we'd pray before every show you know and, and as funny as we were and as, as ridiculous as it would be when we came out there you know we had the spirit hmm. i honestly could talk to you for hours i do love the point that you just made at the end about how faith was clearly the center of making sure that the work that you were creating was good but overall your story one is just obviously ins inspirational, but it's very evident that you can have multiple skill sets and thrive at all of those things and still continue to be successful on a regular basis. What do you hope that the next generation of not only architects, but filmmakers will learn from your career and your story? Well, I th first of all, I think um, uh, self-belief mm -hmm. is very important. And uh, I, I certainly believe that faith is very important. You know, uh, I've been a, a strong believer in that uh, since, you know, my grandmother, paternal, the fourth grade, you know, turned me on to, you know, a prayer that I've recited since I was in the fourth grade. And every morning I get up, you know, I spend time on prayer and meditation before I, my feet hit the floor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say... Um, What's the prayer? Do you mind sharing No, it? I, that's it's private. Oh, okay. And so um, it'd be, that's between my grandmother and I. No, right? no, I understand. I understand. Yeah. So um, uh, I would say that um, education is very important. Now, education doesn't necessarily mean that you're in a classroom sitting at a desk. Mm -hmm. It means that uh, life is a lifelong kindergarten and you should always be learning, you know? And uh, I have never uh, stopped studying writing, never. And there has, a day never goes by that I don't write. So writing has been very centrifugal to everything that I do. And, um, the next thing I would say is that ideas are pierced at their moment of, comp of, of uh, inception. But from that point on, it's all compromise. So the idea is easy, but the actuation and the materialization of the idea is always very hard. And that's where a lot of people fail because, you know, we always see the red carpet but we never see the hard work. And I would say that you have to put more thought into the process by which you are going to actuate an idea and, and apply as, as much or more, obviously more creative thought in that space, you know, than the inception of the idea itself. I could stand out and I could stand I could stand down and, and, you know, I could stand on any street corner with a box and that idea would get filled, that box would get filled up very fast. But if you ask people, well, how are you going to do that? 
it's going to take a while. So I would say that. And I would say, uh, you know, uh, dreams are important. I would say that. And and you have to you know, hope for your dreams. And uh, hope is, uh, you know, too strong to kill, you know. And you have to have some courage because, uh, you know, courage is always just around the corner, but you have to have courage to call on it. And that faith is real. And, you know, uh, you always should, if you're going to play, uh, you got to play to win and not thinking about losing because the hard roads are always the roads worth choosing. But, you know, if you win, you'll look back and smile and you'll say it was worth every mile. You know, so, uh, you know, uh, there's a great book called Art and Fear, you know. You know, I, I told somebody today they were talking about fear. I said, well, I said, you don't really know fear. So I'm going to tell you what fear is. The fear is getting in the ring with someone like Mike Tyson, knowing that he wants to go home early. Mm. You know, okay. So he's hungry. <laughs> he's hungry. He's going to whip you. So don't come in there if you ain't ready. And, and so it's it's a, a tough game, but you know, you got to learn the game. You know, you got to pay some dues. And uh, they're, they're, the, the, the dreamers, you know, if it wasn't for the dreamers, and you know what, uh, uh, Mike, you know, Michael Fronte is a singer from San Francisco. You know, here's what he says. And so, by the way, just to say this, my drug is creativity, you know, so all of those things spin off of that spine, okay? It's just about learning. I had to learn space, okay? I had to, I had to get up and learn space. But Michael Fronte says, you know, all the freaky people make the beauty of the world. That's his thing. That's you know, true, that's yeah. that's the that's the deal. So, uh, if 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 you want it, you got to go for it. You know, you got to be prepared to make the sacrifices. I can remember times when uh, I was out of out of cash, and the babies need milk, and we had to borrow from my daughter's piggy bank and go get one of them dollar forty nine spaghetti dinners. Mm -hmm. You know. But you, you keep going. And family has been the uh, foundational piece for me then and now. You know, so um, when I was coming along, it was my grandparents and my mother, you know, and now uh, that I'm, you know, moving on in life and I'm a senior, it's now my daughters. You know, you know, I talk to every one of them every day. And so, uh, but the space thing, they were all up in there. <laughs> they were all up in it, you know. Yeah, they should. <laughs> you know, my daughters, my kids are all up in it. And, you know, my cousins and my sisters, you know, that's how I roll. You know, so we're like a village, right? That's needed, and, yeah. Yeah, and we, we, we kind of behind, we quiet and behind the curtain, you know. <laughs> you know, we don't need, you know, uh, a whole lot of recognition. I ain't got no pinstripes, double-breasted suits. You know, I'm just trying to make it happen. And, you know, I always see myself and have seen myself as a drummer and, and not as a drum major. You know, my the thing I wanted to be first in life was a priest, you know. And, and when I was uh, 13, that was my thing. And then when I was 14, I discovered girls, so I had to shut <laughs> it off for a minute. Never mind. <laughs> Uh, God, please, I got to put this on the shelf for one minute, okay? Right. And, so, and then I, I had a chance to go when I was in my 20s again. And when I came back to Boston, the first place I went was the uh, uh, Episcopal Divinity School because I that's been my thing. You know, I'm, I'm, I, this is all about service. I think it's coming through me. It ain't me alone. It's coming through me. Amen. Thank you for that. Well, of one to wrap up and kind of tie back to the beginning, I do want to shout out the website, This Little Light of Mine in Space, for those who want to learn more about your film and its travel around us in space at the International Space Station. But Topper Karo, your conversation has been more than insightful. And as a Martin fan, I do appreciate not only the work you've done on television, but just learning about your architecture career as well. 
keep up the great work. Thank you. Well, that's the that's the that's the plan, and uh, I'm a son of Roxbury, and very proud of that. I know they're proud of you too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.